Our presenters today are Sasha Kahana. He is the Global Director of Product Management for Bosch. He is in charge of all Bosch camera development programs globally. Hey, these two guys are way smarter than me, so bear, bear with me. He is also joined by Dr. Sam, wait to hear this, Principal AI Scientist and Senior Research Manager at the Research Technology Center in Pittsburgh for Bosch, PhD in Audio Analytics, worked on SoundSea on the International Space Station, which improves safety and operations on the space station. I'm not even in his league. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even spell his last name, that's how dumb I am. <laughs> but seriously, um, they will be available today down <clears throat> stairs at the Bosch exhibits. Um, so please give your undivided attention to Sasha and Dr. Sam. Thank you for coming today, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we, have, we have since morning spoken a lot about vision-based analytics, AI. We have, we have spoken a lot today. During this session, we want to add another modality of, uh, you know, of analytics and how you can understand your environment better by bringing another modality, which is basically sound analytics. Okay. Before we go, oh, it's working. Before we go deeper into the subject, yeah, I wanted to you know, set the stage a little bit, you know, what kind of audio analytics, what is the sound anal analytics that we are engaged with, because these days there is a very, very big use of speech-based analytics which is being done. You know, all, your, all your cell phones, your, your devices at your home, you can talk to them, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of technology, uh, artificial intelligence which goes into it, which is engaged or which is doing your speech analysis to understand what you are saying you know sometimes it's also used these days for recognition of the of the voice or associating it with a person or or it can also be used for you know mas machine based translations all that thing these devices are able to do we our scope of of research and the products we are developing is nothing to do with speech we are in the domain of understanding the sound understanding what is happening in an ambient environment and then classify these sounds into whether if there is an anomaly or not you know i mean I, I would say that you know for example the speech and the recognition this is kind of a of a, of a limited use case kind of, or, or a limited uh, uh, data set kind of a problem because you know you always give a wake word and after that these devices know that they have to start uh, analyzing and language is kind of predictable AI can predict that you know once you have started speaking, what potential are your next next words? What you're saying, it can predict. In our case, it's an open space problem. We never know what kind of sound is going to come to us, when it will happen, what is it's going to follow. We, we we do not understand that. So also the 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 methods, the algorithms, the techniques we apply is quite different from what is happening in the speech-based analytics. So our use cases where we try to go, like I said, we we go into the use cases where we are trying to find abnormal sounds which might happen in your environment. You know, like uh, cases like when you have a glass break, right? You have gunshot detection. That's, that's, a, that's a very, very important use case for us. We are investing quite a research in, in understanding this, and, and Sam will talk about gunshot a little bit in more details today. Also then loud noise anomalies, you know, if suddenly there is a loud noise, we try to understand whether this is an explosion or somebody dropped a heavy box or something, those kind of things. And also another interesting uh, topic where we are investing is understanding about the alarms, right? If, 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 if my camera is hearing some kind of alarms, can we classify it whether this is coming from a car or CO2 or these kind of classifications of alarms because we think there are a lot of use cases, a lot of semantic understanding about the scene that you can have when you have these kind of additional modality in your, in your data. Somebody asked me in the morning that how does it tie with the vision-based analytics that we are doing. So this is what I'm saying that you know we are bringing another modality of understanding of your of your scene, another another sensor input into our AI world so that we have a better understanding about the scene. So all the all the vision-based analytics that we discussed in morning, what what uh, what uh, Joel was talking about, where you can you know detect cars, people, all that stuff with great reliability. We believe that if we add audio to it, we can have better understanding. You know, for example, I just try to paint a picture here that 
if you have a you have a you have a parking lot and suddenly there's a car which starts beeping right just only with the vision based analytics we may not be able to find it or we may need more time to find that compared to if you have if you couple it with an audio analytics because with audio we can also do triangulation we can find where the source is and all that stuff we can also go and pinpoint that okay guys this is a car it's beeping for some reason or if there's an event like a gunshot we can also you know sometimes it's it's it takes a lot of time before you recognize that there's an event which has happened which needs an attention with this modality we can add to the vision based analytics find where the gunshot has give you a uh, you know direction you know look into this camera and and you know that it can it can pop up on your screen so this is the idea is that we want to enhance the scene understanding the understanding of your environment so that the operators who are uh, uh, w working in the security space they can take much more informed decision and much faster decisions so i quickly wanted to introduce you to where bosch comes into this audio analytics i mean we have been you know us from the vision based analytics from cameras and all that stuff but where does bosch comes in in the in the audio analytics we have a a competent center in pittsburgh which is our regional technology center where we have dedicated investments and research happening in, in, in the space of audio analytics. And this is where Sam works. So I'll, I'll hand over to Sam to talk about Pittsburgh a little bit and the work that he's doing. Sure, thank you, Sachin. Yeah, very excited to be here and talk a little bit about the science and technology that goes behind solving a problem like audio recognition. Uh, so first of all, of course, we are looking at it in Pittsburgh. We're looking at cutting edge research for Bosch's future products and services. And also in the process, working closely with business unit like securities technology to get them onto actual products. One of the core focus areas that my research group focuses on is audio AI. Now, I would like to start by saying this. Did you guys know that even the sound of a CPU fan from your laptop can reveal what class of encryption algorithm you're running? Because depending on the encryption algorithm computational load, it varies the CPU current, the fan current, and then in turn result in the fan noise frequencies. So what I'm trying to say is that audio can reveal a lot more information about the environment than we take it as face value. We just have to figure out how to learn those salient patterns. This is where AI comes into play. We didn't invent audio recognition or audio analysis. It's a decade old discipline, right? What I bring to the table is state-of-the-art AI algorithm to really extract information out of those audio cues. And we not only do that in-house, but we also have, as a research lab, we also have strong ties with world's best universities. Uh, Carnegie Mellon, New York University Music and Audio Research Lab is our collaborator. Also, we work with NASA, uh, as, you uh, as, 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 uh, as you heard about our mission to the International Space Station, which I'll talk about in a second. But this is kind of the context, right? Doing cutting edge research, but at the same time getting our hands dirty to really understand the real world challenges to be able to do this thing under unpredictable environment. How do you really robustly recognize gunshot? How do you robustly recognize alarms and so forth without spitting out a lot of false alarm? This is the key. Now, speaking of which, uh, we, we are well established in the research community. We have uh, all these uh, 16 publications, 14 patents, and our work is highly cited as a research of side of things. But then I would like to talk about how we are really taking this cutting edge research as uh, you know, AI researcher and bringing them into real products. This is what we're doing, get our hands dirty, <laughs> right? Drawing to actual gun ranges, having all these different guns, and collecting data to train our algorithm at the same time validating how good is our algorithm against all the different interferences that you can expect from an environment. But also to the right, I would like to also show what you're doing. Really high flying research, literally, like 250 miles above the Earth. So this is first ever space mission from Bosch that I'm, I'm really fortunate to lead. <clears throat> Working with the astronauts, this is a device that you send sound, see, seeing with sound. Actually, it's an audio AI device. It has this, you know, really uh, you know uh, a whole bunch of microphones over there as you'll see um, and this device writes on this really unique robot it's called astrobe built by nasa's ames research center we happen to be the first ever commercial payload on this robot so this robot is zero gravity floats around in the space station and we sit on it and basically capture this acoustic field information from the space station for doing several things like understanding whether their acoustic limits are too noisy for astronauts' health, 
but also go close to very important critical infrastructure to understand for audio cues if they're operating normally or not. For example, the life support system machine and plant habitat machine and so on and so forth. So this is ongoing space mission and working periodically with astronauts live from Bosch Research to really understand how in a challenging environment, talk about a challenging environment, all these different machines and stuff, how do you really solve the audio AI problem? Now coming back to the ground. Uh, so this is kind of the microphone array that we actually built in-house at Bosch to be able to do that in the space station. Now, coming down on Earth, how do you really make products that really leverage this research and enable valued services for our customers? Gaussian recognition. I shouldn't justify that's a very important recognition capability we had, right? There are many things you could do, but let's talk about Gaussian recognition. Literally, there are open source tools you could probably pull out and develop a Gaussian detector, but I'll ask the question, how good is it? Can you deploy it anywhere and it's going to not give out any false alarm? That is the key. If you have a Gaussian detector, it is giving you even a few false alarm, people will not use it because it's just too costly from end user's perspective. So our research focuses on how do you really understand with AI how gunshot is saliently different from all of the confusing sound that might be tricked as gunshot. And if you could do that well and reliably, then of course you can think about applications here like office and workspaces, parking lots and schools, this could be very useful. So there's a huge societal benefit to be able to do that well. Now, you might have heard about a lot of gunshot recognition capabilities and we are not the first, but what we are really bringing to the table as a cutting edge research capability is how to use, again, deep learning and state of the art AI to really do several things. First thing, learn from examples, right? You cannot really, like, computer vision is different than audio, by the way, right? Audio is a one dimensional signal. You have all these interferences, echo vibration. How do you really train your system to be able to understand that Gunshot or alarm might sound differently. It can represent itself in a very different form. There's no explicit or physics-based way to write those equations down to be able to do that. Of course, you have to do it with training. And statistical machine learning is what we are doing to be able to do that robustly. And you've shown that we can do that. So we are building our model from our data pipeline that we collected on the field, but also using physics-based model to mimic all these environmental effects. Like my voice might sound a little different if I'm talking in a much smaller room. Same thing, gunshot or glass break will sound different. How do you really do that, right? So there, really quickly, I'll go over a little bit of the science behind it is that this is very standard, right? How you, you collect your audio data, raw data, electrical signals with microphones, and then you basically extract the frequency components, which will make it unique compared to other kinds of sounds. And then you learn your machine learning algorithm. That's the standard way of kind of looking at it. But how we do this really like two minutes I like to spend here is that first I say you have to address the most important thing, how do you make it robust, right? Anybody can train AI algorithm, but making a robust AI algorithm is the key. We have physics-based model, right? We could simulate different geometries. There's two ways, basically, let me step back. You could either have a physics-based way of mimicking all these different kind of interferences that will be presented with and feed that into your network to be able to trick it to learn those perturbations, but that will never cover everything possible. You have to get your hands dirty, go to the real world, and collect those data about false alarm to be able to do that robust. So we do both of them hand in hand. Here we have like room impulse for network, impulse response generator. What does it mean that you could mimic different kinds of room, different kind of environment that will be throwing your product into and figure out how the reverberation characteristics will be, how the reflection characteristics will be. Mix it with other interfering noise you can expect in a different environment and basically push it to the network and represent the audio in a manner that then the algorithm can chew on and basically able to learn from that data. As you can see, one way to look at it is you can represent a spectrogram, it's a time frequency map of audio. A glass break looks like this, and a coffee machine making coffee looks like that. So almost you can already, you saw this you know, a presentation from computer vision, you can almost Im imagine you can represent audio as images and basically learn from that. But last slide, what I have is we have done better. We basically have a way to literally learn from raw electrical signals of audio that your microphone captures and let the network learn what salient frequency component is useful for your task at hand or not. Meaning you might be interested in gunshot versus nothing happening. Or you might be interested in multi-class classification of scream, gunshot, and alarm. These are two different tasks to the AI because the ability to discriminate rest of the background from gun sound 
is different as a mathematical problem than recognizing four or five different classes together. So we let the algorithm decide, depending on the use case, what frequency components are useful for it to really pay attention to and model that. And that, what we have done, we have published this, we have patented this, and we have shown over and over again that this is the way to go about learning it from scratch. This is where data is so important when you give these examples and all these examples of perturbations that you can expect in an environment, it can learn the salient frequency component to be able to do that well. And that's what I like to hammer out that doing that well is very important. Not a lot of false alarms could be afforded in this case. And we are able to then deploy them on the edge like I said, from this research of how do you really learn the subtle cues that audio has to actually deploying that on a real camera, which Sachin is going to talk about now. Thanks a lot, Sam, for making this so exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, this, this Sam really pointed out nicely that you know, we are investing in, in doing the gunshot detection or, or other alarms detection based on, on our uh, artificial intelligence perspective. Because like he was saying that you know, AI has these capabilities that when we keep training it, training it with all the data that we have collected. I mean, Chesapeake Marketing has helped us in, in collecting so many gunshot sounds. But with, that in, with, with all these audio sounds that we have collected, we have trained a model to a point where it can really recognize with a very, very high reliability what are the frequency spectrum it analyzes to, de to, to determine if it's a gunshot or not. And then Sam like already mentioned that we also have in our software models that we take this, this audio, this, this, this sound, and then augment it with, with different background noises. Right, we, we blend it with, with traffic, we blend it with, with how a reverberation in a, in a hall might sound, all that stuff, and then create even much bigger data sets to train these algorithms that they can be basically used in a real life environment and not just only in a, gun sh in, in, in a shooting range. Talking about how, how can we now present this to you. Ta-da! Yeah. So, we are already working on productizing this and bringing this to the market so that we can start uh, you know, deploying this in the field. And, uh, and we have a first camera, which is a Flexidome uh, panoramic camera. This camera comes with an integrated microphone array. <coughs> We have used this camera also during our training state. So all the data that we have been collecting for the shooting range, we collected with this camera itself, with the actual hardware, because like Sam was saying, it's very, very important that your AI is trained on the right frequencies, and this really depends on what kind of microphones are, are, are being used. So we use this actual hardware to collect all the data, train our AI, and now we are ready, basically, we have, we have already POCs and, and prototypes running where these algorithms are, are running in the camera. We have done some testing with some of our customers, but I think we are coming at a stage where we can bring this to more sites, more projects where we can do POCs. Why, why I'm stressing on the POCs? Because in this case, every room, every building, every parking lot will have always some kind of a different characteristics. And we will have to go through together with our customers, together with our partners to understand their environment and adapt our models to basically give a very, very robust detection in your environment. Because like Sam was already pointing out, one of the most important thing for us is that we want to deploy it in a way that you have zero false alarms. Because a false alarm can totally destroy the use of or, or the trust in this particular system. So, so this is the reason why I, I'm stressing on the POCs that this would be our approach, that you know, when we are going in the projects and in a real life deployment, we would like to work with our customers to, to test it for some time and see how the systems are behaving. And then wherever we have to tweak it, then we have, we have our yeah, technical force. Good thing is available in US on East Coast to, to help us in, in, in you know, tuning this for, for the right environment. Little bit about the system concept. So it's not only that we have just thought only about the camera. We are also thinking about the system that how this, this is going to be deployed. So one of the important use cases that we, are, we have been working that how this camera works in an environment where you have multiple cameras. So because in this uh, panoramic camera, we have, a, we have a three microphones, basically it's a microphone array. We also have the capabilities to get the direction or the direction of, of the audio. So we have the possibility that we can integrate this camera also with a PTZ. So when a gunshot or an event is detected, you can send a camera to a particular spot, and then you, you, know, then you can also trigger some vision-based AI, you know, which means if you want to do an auto-tracking of a person and all those kind of integrations is possible. The camera works in a normal way that this audio alarms and events are also available in standard uh, video management systems. 
Yeah, BBMS is one environment where this is this will be available. That when you have an audio event, it is recorded. It's it's shown in your in your monitor. One important thing, I, I stress it upon, which is about the data and the privacy. The audio from the camera never leaves and goes anywhere outside. All the analysis is done on the edge in the device. Number one. Number two, we have software algorithms in place. Sam has provided us with those algorithms. We always cut out the, the voice. So if there is somebody talking in this, the camera shuts down it. It doesn't, it doesn't hear those spe uh, uh, frequency spectrums at all, just to be sure that we are not getting into the privacy issues with, uh, with this particular device. And uh, yeah, and, and basically, like, you know, this is fully embedded, fully functional, standalone, self-contained system. You are not sending anything out. Everything happens. And, I mean, when there are models, new models available, we can deploy it on the site from on-prem solution, or if you like, also via cloud. But there is no necessity of connecting this camera for the cloud for any analysis or or any any you know further uh, feedback from outside. It's not required. We have been testing this particular device right now, and so far we have, uh, based on the performance, we believe we can cover a, a kind of a diameter of about 100 feet. That's that's we can cover for a, for a reliable detection of of, uh, of different uh, guns and different ammunition. We have been testing with different calibers, different size of the guns, and and of course, I mean, we can go into details. We have all these parameters that how 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 we behave with different kind of uh, of, of arms. So where we are right now, what are our, uh, our steps? So we are, like I said, we are in the, in the, in the phase of pilot projects. We are in, in, in stage of doing POC. So if there are any requirements, any projects where you'd like to test it, try it out, yeah, we can, we can have a discussion. You can have uh, via Chesapeake, or you can approach me directly as well. And then we can, we can think about the places where we can, we can deploy this. Our first POC or the, or the algorithm that we have is gunshot. We also have scream detection available. So I mean, these are the two we have. But I mean, we, we want to go further. But it's, I mean, the idea is that we want to also co-create with our partners, with our customers, because there are so many use cases out there. I mean, many of them we cannot even think about. So. That brings me towards end of our presentation, our session today. Thank you so much. And if there are any questions, yeah. Yeah. Um, Sam. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, like, so object recognition. A lot of your early research and a lot of what you've done yeah. throughout your career, spatial recognition. So yeah. Using the visual cues that a lot of our field of use can have, and using the auditory analysis, the sound analysis at this level. At what at what point does can we layer or intertwine these to where the metadata sets not match but actually work together in determining the the confidence level in a the field of view mm -hmm. and what is occurring in the field of view and the auditory cues that are being taken from what wherever the proximity hundred feet is an amazing proximity being that I've pretty much assessed every single <laughs> <laughs> But it, it, it's really, it's really, you use triangulation, which is very taboo in most cases, but at the level of auditory analysis you guys are looking at, and what you did with, with a lot of the work in with sightseeing, right? Sure. Transitioning a, 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 sure. a spectrogram into something understandable and to be able to determine minute changes in frequency ranges and waveform mm -hmm. patterns, and it, it, I mean, you're doing it in a very... I mean, ultimately, it's a space station, right? So highly pressurized space. Mm -hmm. um, sound is, isn't necessarily too anomalous because everything is understood to be existing. Right. It, it's there. We know how many male, female astronauts they are, what dialects they are, so you're able to knock out speech and focus on mechanical. Sure. So with like, how, how, how is that? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. And it, you see, the spatial representation of sound, all those sounds are one dimensional, is first starts with the spectrogram, right? And you can almost intuitively see, okay, uh, just like a cat and a dog different uh, in their own ways in terms of geometry of their shape and textures, the spectrograms also reveal themselves as different textures and different dynamics over time, and then you represent it in a time block. So it's kind of an image, but it's not really an image. The okay. final frontier of pushing it further is actually doing what we are working on right now is audiovisual representation learning. Meaning if I st keep staring at the scene for a long time, which AI will be doing, right. and try to correlate 
the, depend, the pixel dynamics in that particular scene with the spectrogram that is generated out of the pixel dynamics and actually overlay it and learn the overlay color map in an end-to-end -end fashion. Meaning if you have a lot of data, let's say you see someone walking uh, with a with with a, with a you know boot on a on a wooden surface like and close your eyes you know that in this field of view someone is walking right these audio cues but if you also have the picture of the person walking you can correlate the audio coming from the interaction of the boot to the ground as compared to all other interaction that might be happening which are not generating those sound exactly. cues and that's what we are actually working on actually this is a part of our collaboration that's at New York huge. University that's that's to really map it the way we actually ourselves relate to it, right? If you, if you see some events and I look at the scene, I say, okay, this is the repetitive sound that comes from someone knocking on the door, for example, right? And that's, that's the next, of course, it's not, um, you know, ready for prime time yet in terms of how do you integrate it in the camera, but that's where the research is going. What is audio visual representation learning as a cue? Not audio separately, video separately, and then finally piece it together, but actually learning at the get-go when the events generate itself. Yep. It just, it make yeah, it's an exciting, exciting That's field. Great. Yeah, it's starting with audio recognition, but then you know you could uh, you could. Well, there's just there's so many right. already data sets available for that level. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of challenge. We just recently released a data set with audiovisual cues to be able to learn such uh, representations, and yeah, we're so excited about this. Most recent patents yeah. Flash, which is phenomenal with the autonomous audio sensing and everything. What you can do, hopefully, get to the point to where we can do it mobily, right? Have our body sure. cams. Be yeah. able to determine the slide of a gun before that gun gets pulled from yeah, so yep. downstairs. Yep. yep. I, I fully agree that we need to reach a point where we can probably even become predictive about analyzing and, and able to predict this kind of an event that probably there is a person approaching and he may have some wrong intentions. Right, be it in the school to an office building to a shopping mall, because this this these events are happening everywhere. I, I agree. I mean, the the gunshot detection right now, or or where we are at this moment, we we try to improve the response time so that once the event has happened, then you try to contain it as quickly as possible. That it's it's not it's not getting worse. Right. This is this is where this technology is right now. But I think you know to go in the direction where you are saying we. Definitely, it's a research topic because over there we would need again multi modalities, you know, like to understand behavior of a person because we know that when the person is in this kind of a mode, he might, he should, or he would behave a little bit differently. There are other technologies as well. I mean, it's, it's not in scope of, of this presentation today, but we have been, t uh, you know, talking in research about using some things like radar and stuff like that where you can. Really, based on the reflection coming from human body, you can detect if the if the person is carrying too much metal on his body. It's it's concealed. You can you can reach that spot. Again, we are not there at the moment where I can I can say that it's a product or you know it's it's a research topic. But this is definitely an area where we all are thinking that how can we become just from reactive into pre, uh, to to predictive. But I, I think research still needs a little bit more time and, and and our AI models need to grow a little bit more to to reach that maturity level. But I, I fully agree. I mean, that's that's our vision. That's our ambition. That way, we want to go from from a reactive into a predictive mode. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Good question. So, um, which use cases do you feel like you guys have ready? The... We can hear you. Yeah. Which use cases <laughs> do you feel like you guys have ready at the moment? Um, you know, I know you talked about gun detection. And which ones do you see being used in the future? Um, so right now we, like, like I already mentioned, that gunshot is, is basically something where we have a lot of data, we have a matured model, we have tested where we, we feel we are ready for, for coming uh, uh, for, for our POCs. In the future, we also see that this could be potentially used for, uh, for applications. I mean, there are such, such, some trials which are going on in, in Germany for also yeah. in, in the traffic, traffic environment to basically understand what kind of vehicles do you have, you know, Gas, diesel, electric. I mean, these kind of things that we wanna we wanna uh, determine. There are some use cases we have. We are trying in again in, in Europe where you know you have the bike lanes, and we want to be able to determine that if on a bike lane you have a you have something which is going very very fast. So it's a scooter or it's an e-bike which is going beyond uh, a speed. You know, we try to we are trying to solve this problem also with audio. So our goal is that you know 
based on our research, we want to increase the scope that we go from, uh, you know, these alarm detection and anomaly detection also to start characterizing and understanding, you know, what kind of objects are and, you know, based on their sound characteristics. Combine it together with, uh, with with video, of course. And it also to add to that, it also depends on the kind of sensor package you're deploying, right? For example, with a linear array of four microphones, we are able to detect multiple lanes of traffic, how many cars are passing by, and their frequency over time during the day. So these things are feasible. Of course, this needs to be adapted in both in terms of software as well as the kind of how the microphone is sensing the acoustic field, so to speak, the target scene that you're. And we are also, as, as Sachin mentioned, we are also working on that. Yeah. Sure. There's a gunshot detection uh, system deployed in Baltimore City around a local university. They got a lot of problems with uh, false alarm from firecrackers yep. mm -hmm. in the area. <laughs> yep. Uh, is this system that discriminating that it can determine between a firecracker and a, a handgun or a, a pistol going on? You would I can I can I can try to answer this. Answer so so we have uh, we have done some testing uh, and not so much right now with firecrackers, but we did with training. We we did when we did our training of our our AI models, we did a training with live uh, uh, ammunition. Okay, so and we did some experiments to see how nicely we are able to react uh, react if we make a gunshot, gunshot sound which is not coming from live ammunition. For example, with blanks or just from the audio running from the speaker. And what we have seen is that our models right now react very, very nicely only when you have a, a real uh, ammunition or, or real, real bullets that you're using. On the blanks and on the uh, sound coming from the speakers, our system just don't react. So this is where we believe that our, our models have reach the maturity level where they are able to, again, Sam might be able to explain <laughs> a little bit more technical, but we are really able to, to identify either it's a, it's, a, it's a supersonic breakthrough of the bullet or whatever yeah. frequencies yeah. we are able to now sense. But, but the models have shown that they are more robust or, or more in biased towards detecting real gunshot rather than firecrackers or, or back, backfire from your cars. We, we don't react on that. And to add to that, that's why AI Statistical machine learning, should I say, where you could give examples of the algorithm to learn is important. So we understand that the physics of how gunshot event occurs, right? A, a ballistic event, a object leaving a barrel, the kind of blast wave and acoustic wave it will generate. Of course, guns are different, but the basic principle is similar versus a firecracker is an open without any, you know, in a barrel, so to speak. Uh, you understand, let's say, the physics. How do you really model it? Can you write an equation to model it? It's not possible. That's why. What we are doing with our data augmentation technique is to encode such things through example data where you can mimic such what they call there's different events, sub-events of a gunshot where it's called muzzle blast and then there's a transient when the bullet starts leaving. How do you really, yeah, how do you really model that? And that's what we have actually built in to be able to really recognize them as well as possible from all those other, you know, like explosive events which are not constituting of some heavy object leaving a barrel, for example. So one of the problems that they determined was that if the gunshot was pointed away from the sound detecting device, it didn't pick up the supersonic level of right. the projectile. Right. It only heard the noise. Right. So a firecracker, by the same token, would create noise with those supersonic level. Right. So where do we go from there? But our hypothesis, and that's a very good question, is that there are other cues that we cannot probably interpret or pen down with the physics model that differs from a firecracker to a gunshot. And this is where artificial neural network, again, this is again hypothesis. I'm not gonna claim that this is exactly how it should be. This is where the subtle clues, when I gave the first example that audio has more cues that we take it at face value, this is where our hypothesis lies. That, and, and from our experimental data, again, I cannot really theoretically prove that this is how it works. From our experimental data, we are able to absorb this data and train the model which seem to actually discriminate it better. And that's what I would say is what is salient aspect of how all the gunshot that came before versus now, you know, the, the, what the research committee bringing to the table can be different from, from in terms of increasing the robustness. But again, this is a hypothesis based on the fact that we could train such models with these different yeah. examples. 
and also talking about the product that we have and the, and the, and the, and the solution that we're going to bring in the market right now, we don't think that we, we want to go into a city kind of an environment. I mean, we are more are in and around the office buildings. That's, that's where our scope is, where I think right now we also have a good understanding about what kind of ambient sounds you are dealing with, you know, traffic, and these are the things that we have modeled in, in our data augmentation. So, but, but we, have, we have some level of confidence right now that we are able to filter out those kind of things which can sound otherwise as a gun shop. We didn't, I mean, we, we do have a lot of data with different guns, but we haven't gone into the classifications of the guns, so we, no, we, we haven't done that. In the future that. pipeline, yeah. Maybe in the future, right? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question regarding um, how do you envision this with a customer? Um, so, uh, being that it's good job detection, aside from saying that your system works excellently, how do you commission this at a customer site, aside from getting a whole bunch of guns and going to shoot them off? What do, you, do you have some sort of way of doing that? Uh, so far, I mean, we have been trying to do this in in a, in a places where we are allowed to shoot guns. <laughs> okay, so basically, which means in the in the in the in the shooting range where we bring customer, do some tests with them, and also show that if there are non gunshot sounds which are there, then how the system is reacting to it. This is why I, I I come back again that what our goal is that we know that we have a certain level of confidence on our on our. Um, gunshot detection in a, in a real environment. So if, if there's a site that you want to test it, what our goal would be that we test that the false alarms are not generating these gunshot detections. So this is something that we can do either with blanks or dropping big objects or honking, you know, uh, uh, horns and all that stuff. We would try to simulate that these common loud noises are not causing false positives in your environment. I mean, but there are certain customers who, who have agreed that they have permissions in their facilities for doing the testing and, and trials that they can also do some uh, live uh, shots but I mean they are really large customers and with large properties where they have this kind of permission but normally for, for the normal projects where we try to do this is minimize the false positives and then and then I mean it gives us certain confidence that our, our gunshot is, is going to work in a, in a reliable way. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult problem I, I fully agree. I've got another question. Um, so, if we were to start with the market, we saw the user use case, say, um, like one of them that I hear about is industrial, like industrial works or like oil wells, hearing if there's, say, a motor going out on one of their express stations or something like that. What would you guys need to have to start um, researching what the new use case? Data. A bunch of audio? Data. Clips of uh, normal clips of. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you if you give us what is a normal sound, then it's easy to find what is abnormal. So, I mean, if we if we know if we get our data from this oil well or from this motor running that how this is sounding when it's it's yeah. working normally, we can model that if this is not working right, then uh, then you know. Or and we are specifically investigating this <laughs> is <laughs> this exact problem, right? This complex machine you could see from the space station stuff where how do you really model normalcy, where normalcy itself can go through different phases, right? Different Correct. operating condition of your well well. And this is where this is called self-supervised learning, where you don't have to label all the data that you provide to us. We can uh, have this algorithm to learn the model of normalcy. Again, this is again, this is a problem that people have been looking at for decades in control theory and everything. But again, with a data-driven neural network-based approach, we could actually train the model to have a much more versatile way of capturing the different nuances to normalcy, right? That's the trick, right? You don't know when the machine probably goes through a different operating state or is an abnormal thing that you've never seen before. And this is where a lot of the investigation that you're doing is really helpful. Yep. And can you do, do you that record that audio with anything, like even a cell phone? Um, or what kind of system do you record that data? Okay, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I would, I would say that we would prefer to do it with an actual hardware because these microphones they play a very, very important role in yeah. in how, how the sound is present, uh, presented to the AI models. Yeah. 
In an ideal world, you'd like to have structure-born sound from those machines, but then obviously there is a transfer function from the structure-born all the way to the product, but then again, we want to solve the harder problem because that's how it's going to be deployed, Correct. right? Yeah. Correct. Okay, so step one, just get that camera, that um, question that we can get that on site doing the audio recording. That would be a great step one. Yeah, sure. Yeah, how are you accounting for, I know that between like Flexidomes and uh, Panoramics, the Bosch camera itself hears differently between the two and depending on what kind of microphone you have. How are you guys compensating for that or, yeah. you know, to make sure that you're getting the same sound from two different cameras, two different backgrounds, two different microphones? I, I, can, I can take the first shot at it. That's actually part, a very important point as a part of our data augmentation scheme where we can mimic what's called bi-quad equalization to mimic different transfer function of different microphones. That is the first kind of adaptation we need to do to be able to make sure that you train the model with a different microphone and they deploy it in a different product. How do you really adjust for the difference in microphone transfer function? And that's what we actually built in. Once you collect the data, we basically that's the part where I say synthetic physics beta aspect. This is one of the key aspects there to mimic different microphone transfer functions. I agree with him, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever he said, I agree with him. <laughs> yes, please. You mentioned, I believe, that uh, you guys are accurate within 100 feet of the device. What happens outside of 100 feet? Um, no, the, the, the detection level is, the confidence level starts going down. That's the a, that's a challenge, yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, and um, uh, do you have the ability to maybe listen to uh, over the course of uh, a day or time of day and time of week of the background noise to identify things that are particularly an anomaly in a particular environment? Um, I'm talking about air, airports, um, if there's noise, and then I, I just walked in. What's the uh, precision um, 100 feet out as far as? Sam, this is your question. Uh, precision is 99.5%, and uh, recall is about 84, 85% at this time. Plus or minus, I'm looking at plus or minus uh, inches or centimeters. Uh, I don't know what a percentage of what. I'd say plus minus 3% is what I'd say. 3% with respect to the mean value of the accuracy. Within that 100 feet? Within that, oh, you were talking about the distance? Yeah, how Oh, okay, that's, um, I don't know if you have. Uh, I do not data. have that. You mean the, the positional accuracy of, of, the, of the data? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm looking to run robots around airports. Uh-huh. And so I'm looking at different ways of uh, building redundancy for positioning and things. And, and Ah, okay. Oh, you are talking about localization. Okay, sure. so that's something we haven't looked at in terms of positioning. There Accuracy, are other correct. research activities within my group that looked at sound cue based localization where we actually with ultrasonic like 21.5 kilohertz transmitters, we could go into sub centimeter level, like not sub centimeter, a few centimeter level precision, but not within the scope of this project correct. though. Yeah. This is where we're using audio to recognize events and Give a direction. How, how, yeah. yeah, how how quick, how, how far could it go before the accuracy is dropped down? But yeah, I, I, I get what you're talking about in terms of localization using sound cues. Yep. So a few centimeters is the answer, I would say. <laughs> that the one we worked with. So we'll, I mean, if there are more questions, then we, we both are around. We will be downstairs in the, in, in, the, in the technical room as well. So we can pick up more questions there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.